And as we're getting ready to switch to our presenter presentation, let me speak a few words about him. His name is Dr. Philippe Antislavsky. Antislavsky. I said it before. Ans Antislavsky. <laughs> And he is a professor at the Department of Health Sciences at UAA. His focus study is on the interactions between climate change and common community adaptations and resilience in the circumpolar north and on sub sustainable biomaterials uh, development. Uh, his friends also like to consider him a fun guy. So let me, uh, without further ado, invite uh, Dr. Felipe. chronological context. Um, I am an environmental scientist and uh, uh, after spending some time um, foraging through Siberian forests uh, as a kid um, and learning um, a lot about edible fungi um, in uh, the Arctic Russian uh, forests. I then made my way around the world and eventually ended up uh, in a Yale School of Forestry uh, studying interactions between um, living uh, organisms and uh, in soil environments and looking at uh, fungi that inhabit the northeastern um, uh, region of the United States and uh, along the Canadian coast. And um, at the same time, I uh, um, started looking at the options that exist out there uh, to provide materials that are carbon neutral and develop, uh, that can be developed through uh, an interaction between uh, a living organism and, um, and uh, ready to available uh, feedstocks that can be then uh, used for uh, purposes like insulation and uh, packaging and got really interested in uh, biotechnology and biomaterials. And then um, eventually uh, that interest led me to start some experimentation. Uh, and then um, when there was an opportunity to move to Alaska, because coming from Siberia, I always wanted to come back to the north. And it just sounded like a great, great, um, great opportunity to, um, to return home in a way. Um, I jumped on it and we packed our little car and drove from New York City to, to Fairbanks. Uh, and I brought some vials of, of uh, cultures that we have developed in the lab uh, at my prior university at the University of New York. And uh, those vials uh, sat under a dry cabin in Fairbanks for about a year. <laughs> Yeah, we didn't have a lot of space uh, to put them in a, and to feed all of my lab supplies from New York. And I was convinced that all the, all the living cells within uh, the cultures that we brought were dead after a year of you know, cold climate followed by very, very hot summer. To my surprise, when I, when I actually pulled those files out, I saw that the, uh, the mycelium, the, the rootlets that compose uh, the body of the fungus were doing really well and it was full of living organisms. So that's after you know, a couple of months of minus 50 degrees Fahrenheit, which struck me as a really remarkable thing. 
Um, and so when I came back to, um, uh, to research uh, about a year later, um, I thought what, wouldn't it be great to uh, get, to experiment with this material for um, creation, uh, to create insulation for Arctic environment. And that's how uh, this started. And I actually would like to play um, a short clip that Eric made about uh, our lab's work, just to give you a little bit of context. And let's see if it will work. So, this guy, right? always get, is this going to kill me if I do it? <laughs> As people respond to this material, once it's very interesting to see how people respond to this material once you tell them it is um, made out of fungus. My initial reaction was, I've never heard of anything like it. Never heard of insula natural insulation. Pink board or blue board that we use for insulation is typically made out of oil derived polymers that are non biodegradable. They cost a lot to produce. So we use sawdust and natural materials and we add some fungus culture to it and it grows. The fungi has a scaffold that allows for structural integrity and it allows us to create blocks of insulation within a week. The first question we always get. Is this going to kill me if I touch it? It is fungus, but it's not toxic. It's not going to jump on you and try to take over your body. We started off by testing different species to see which ones would produce a foam-like substance that traps air, but also has a skin that sheds the moisture. The next phase uh, we are working on right now is testing for the biomaterial behavior in fire. We are also looking at uh, water absorption and uh, how well this material will perform and their free cell cycles. In this project, we really focus on bringing environmental health, biotechnology, and local knowledge together uh, to bear on the problem when uh, styrofoam and other foams get broken down in the environment. We call it biomaterial because it's biological material. We do not have like, a great name that we came up with, so crowdsourcing may be the way to do it. Two weeks you'll be working with sea lions. Next thing you know is sea lions. You'll be doing a bird survey. You've been working with the Department of Energy. But everybody that comes out here. I think that's a testament to, to your, your own Eric. He does great work with camera and off camera and uh, his ability to really capture the answers of this project. I uh, would like to give you a little bit um, of uh, background from the perspective of uh, wildlife biology and mycology. And um, so mycology is the field of science of biology that, that looks at uh, fungi, lichens, bees. Um, it's sort of this widely diverse kingdom that is poorly understood and poorly described in science. It's kind of, um, if you look at it, it's one of the last frontiers um, in the spectrum of biology. Uh, it's one of the last areas where one can go out into pretty much any forest ecosystem or tundra ecosystem in the world and within days uncover an organism that's not been described. We cannot say that about mammals. We, we, there is um, um, really diverse uh, and incredible world out there that's poorly understood by us. And just to give you a sense of this diversity in Alaska, about 600 some species of different fungi. And uh, many of them have not been described adequately. And even um, 
with my work, I focus on a very small uh, subgroup that is called polypari, which is uh, this ragged looking uh, fungi that you guys saw on the screen earlier today. Uh, even those uh, organisms are poorly described and poorly understood. So, uh, which makes it for um, a lot of fun to work uh, with them, but it also makes it very challenging. Now, I need to figure out how to get this to work. And here, I think this is actually cool. So, to give you a sense of this diversity, um, in Alaska, so this, these are shots that have been taken from Alaskan forests. Uh, this, I believe, is from uh, town of Esther, in south of Fairbanks. Does anybody recognize this organism? <laughs> this one is actually one of the polypori that I just mentioned that is very easy to identify. You can look at it and see that the pattern, well, Depending on where you are in the world, it has different names. Uh, but in North America, it's called turkey tail. Yeah, it's Dramestis versicolor, multicolor for that in Latin. Uh, in, in Russian, it has a different name. In Eurasia, we don't have turkeys. Well, at least don't have wild turkeys. Uh, but you, you can start seeing how, uh, you know, how the colors resemble the, the turkey tail here. Um, it's, it's an interesting organism because it has uh, been uh, studied for quite a while by now uh, by oncologists because of its, um, its ability to suppress uh, mu mu mutation in cells and is being uh, tested repeatedly in, uh, in clinical trials to suppress uh, cancer growth. Now, this guy is uh, another, another very common uh, fungus here in Alaska. Does anybody recognize this one? No. I, I'll give you a, a, a hint to how to recognize this. It's very common, but, but it looks like many other polypori or polypores. When you flip it, it has this, uh, this kind of violet color. Um, and I believe that uh, I, I've come across uh, uh, instances where people have been using this organism for dyes. It's also very commonly used in something called spalding. If anybody is done carpentry uh, with birch, you often come uh, upon logs that have this kind of really beautiful pattern. And uh, this pattern is, uh, is due to this particular organism, rather to spoliport, dyeing the lignin within the tree trunk as it's decomposing it. And um, to make a bit of sense from the name, why is it polypore? Now we again, we are looking at a small sub subset of fungi, but um, the reason we call them polypores is because within this matrix here, so within the body of the fungus, there are viable cells that can spread around the forest ecosystem and sprout new instances of the same organism. And they act, in, in the case of polypari, they're contained in these little tiny tubelets. They're about five microns across. And when the organism is at the la end of its life cycle, it starts meeting millions of them a, a day. And that's how we have this great cultural diversity in, uh, in Alaskan forests, so many fungi in so many different contexts is because each one of those organisms is, is capable of producing billions of spores within, within its lifetime. And another hint, uh, uh, when, you, when you, and I hope you kind of will put this mycology lens as you uh, travel through Alaskan forests, uh, another interesting um, uh, pattern that that's noticeable in many of these polypores is that you have, have these rings, right? And the rings, what, what do you guys think it, they, they describe? Yeah. yeah, it's very similar to the tree, uh, uh, the dendrology. 
So if you count the rings here, you actually can tell how old this organism is. And this, this particular specimen has been around for at least 10, maybe. I can't tell how many rings there are. But it, it seems like it's at least 10 years old. So, um, so being careful with them is actually important because that, this diversity is really dependent on, on stewardship. And so knocking one of those guys out uh, of the tree trunk will essentially uh, produce lesser biological diversity within that, within that patch of the forest floor. Um, so, um, and, and um, there's another one. Very, uh, very different organisms from the same phenological group. And here's another one. And here is uh, an organism that we actually use in our bi biomaterials lab. It's Erpix lactarus. It doesn't even look uh, like a bracket fungus, right? because it's a uh, recipient that sticks to the surface of whatever it grows on. And its primary function is actually very interesting. Um, its primary function is to essentially decompose the living matter, the complex organic compounds, to basic blocks of life. Right? So it breaks down a dead tree matter, dead, uh, dead plant matter for that uh, uh, fact, into very basic elemental units that the trees and other organisms can, can then uptake. So if you look at it from an ecological perspective, this is a critical role in a forest ecosystem, right? Because this dead trees will, will essentially not decompose by themselves in many of our environments. In, in interior, the humidity uh, in the winter is close to Sahara. Right? So the decomposition is extremely slow. So without these agents, you would, would have forests that completely litter with dead matter and it would essentially suffocate, right? Because the nitrogen that's fixated within the tree trunks it will never be, be released. So, so their role is critical. Now, uh, what does it have to do with, with insulation? I'll get to it in a minute. A minute. I, I do want to give you a bit of a spiel on uh, of the the um, genetics and biology of this organism. And I couldn't find the slide in Russian. Oh, sorry, in English. So, so this is in Russian, and I will translate. Uh, but very quickly. So you you have um, what they call mycelium, right? which permeates every square inch of forest floor. And uh, many different species intertwine within the uh, living uh, matter of the soil. Now, if you isolate one of them and put, uh, put it in, um, in a petri dish with nutritive media, um, it will be pretty happy to feed on anything that resembles cellulose, right? So it's, it's breaking cellulose, it's then producing monochromatic cells that will um, not be able to produce uh, a fungus or what we in ecology call fruiting body. And um, they will continue to propagate through the forest floor for, for decades without actually creating a mushroom. Now, um, when these monochromatic cells meet and fuse over here, right? so the two, two strains will never, never overlap. So the organism will, will self-select only exactly the same genetic organism it's composed of. So uh, if you have two strains of, uh, of white mushroom that we buy in the store and you introduce them in vitro, uh, what will happen essentially is a fight for survival. And one inevitably will kill another. So you can, you can think of this process as a really a merge uh, between two identical, genetically identical organisms, right? They find its, uh, themselves, you know, s you know, in this very complex web of um, of tiny, uh, tiny rootlets, which we call mycelia, 
right? They, through enzymatic activity, recognize, recognize one each other and fuse, and then through this, you get to a place where there is a spore formed, and that spore is now ejected by the body of the mushroom. So now you have a fruiting body, which is, you know, it can look like this, or like this, depending on the species, or like this. But now this organism is, is emitting this millions and millions of, uh, of tiny spores. And um, when we first looked at it from kind of bioengineering perspective, we said, well, this is a really interesting material. It's very hard. It's resilient to decomposition. It's chitin for the most part, which is what crustacean uh, exoskeletons are made out of. So it's very tough. Um, it's, uh, it's not bro uh, broken down by water. It resists UV. It, it is resilient to most chemicals. And yet it is very flexible. So it's kind of an interesting phenomenon, right? Um, and then we said, well, is there a way we can capture this, this, um, this, uh, this properties and introduce it, to, uh, introduce it in a kind of a matrix that can then be used for things like insulation and packaging and other applications that will replace plastics? And um, the question of plastics actually became very key um, because uh, in the Arctic, we don't have um, whatever we bring here, rarely leaves. <laughs> and across the Arctic world, many of the building materials that we bring here, once the, once the life, uh, lifetime, the lifespan of the structure is over, guess what? We, we don't re usually remove it from the environment and bring it to some kind of recycling plant. Right? So all the insulation that we put in our buildings usually stays in in Alaska. And that is a problem for two reasons. One is um, the, the, the plastic materials that we use for insulation, like styrofoam, um, they don't decompose uh, within the uh, um, normal environment. They also um, have the tendency to particulize. And so when they particulize, they become uh, either airborne or waterborne, and they travel through the food web. They become now nanoparticles. They become less than one micron in diameter. And for that, bioplankton, plankton, and other 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 organisms can update them. Um, and as they update them, this this uh, nanoparticles travel up 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 in the food web. And we now find a lot of plastic in the guts of of dead seabirds in uh, out in the oceans, and in other uh, in other uh, in other regions of the Arctic. So that's the first reason, so that we, we essentially have a uh, no strategy to remediate any of this stuff. And if you look at the Alaska pipeline alone, the pipeline started from the northern slope of the Brooks Range all the way to Buda Bay. It's actually underlaying about 75 feet um, wide and four feet deep uh, layer of styrofoam. And guess what, when you try to peel this, this stuff off the ground, it, it doesn't come off easily. It um, freezes to the permafrost, it adheres very well. And when you try to remove it, it, it breaks up. And um, if you find like, an old styrofoam cup, try, try, and, you know, try and peel it off something that, that's frozen. And it rips. And so let alone that we don't have a strategy to deal with this, if even if we were to remove all this stuff uh, you know, one day, there is no real strategy for us to recycle it or do anything else with it. So that's, those are the two primary reasons to, um, to look at, at alternatives. This is, by the way, um, this is some pictures from different parts of Alaska. Uh, uh, I think this one, yeah, this one is from Gold Hill Road um, in Fairbanks. You can see how deep this uh, stuff is. So um, we need it because in order for us to construct roads on on permafrost, we need to come up with a way to prevent um, heating and, and cracking 
during during the temperature, you know, cold season and um, and uh, cracking during the hot season during the summer. Right, as the rows heat up, uh, of course, rows act as a lens because they're dark. They attract a lot of sunlight, and they don't don't uh, they don't uh, they capture a lot of it. They absorb a lot of it. So under underlying permafrost melts as a result. So if you put the road on the um, the continuous permafrost without any thermal break, guess what? In a year, this road will look like this, and then it'll look like this, and then it'll look like this again, and it will be the end of the road in a couple of seasons. So for that, we have to have some type of way of insulating it from from the cold ground beneath. Right? And that's what we have been doing so far for several generations. So thousands and thousands of tons of this stuff are, 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 are put into Arctic environments all, all across the Arctic, not just in Alaska. Uh, and um, they have, end up floating around um, our waterways and they end up you know, floating world, uh, the world and end up in, on other shores. They um, present real um, challenges for um, retrieval and remediation because they're really hard to capture. They're buoyant for the most part. They, they, this is unusual, this big blob is unusual. They're usually about five to 10 millimeters across when they break up with the wave activity and mechanical forces in the water. And um, fishing them out of the water bodies is extremely difficult. So we said that, well, let's, let's see if we can, what we call one up, the, uh, the plastics, um, and actually that was the name for our biomaterials lab in, at Alaska Native Science and Engineering program last summer. Uh, and it was uh, the student selection group. We, we, we proposed to come up with a name. So one up plastics was, was the, the name that they chose. And um, our process is fairly simple. We come up essentially with, uh, we, we, we take pure cultures of different organisms, we then add it into a nutritive media uh, so it can grow and watch it. And as we, um, we see this process um, kind of propagate through, through the nutritive media, what happens is this, this, uh, um, this is about five, five millimeters, of five micron across, and um, you know, fairly short uh, segments that spread around um, the cat tradition, they sense for food. They look for something that, that resembles cellulose, which they break very quickly. Um, they um, respond very quickly to their environment, so if they face something that is not hospitable, like when they end, uh, reach the end of the pet tradition, they hit against the glass, so that, you know, that's the edge of the dish, they immediately turn around and, and go back. And um, so you have kind of a smart ecosystem within each one of these petri dishes. And, and um, once they latch on a piece of food, they quickly signal to the, uh, the rest of the hyphae, this, this uh, the, the hyphae, so hyphae is one, hyphae is the plural. Um, these are the segments that, can, can, uh, that, that uh, together um, to make up the mycelium. And so when this happens, uh, they all flock together, essentially, uh, onto the, the piece of food that, that, that's available to them. And as this is digested, they then start spreading around again. So when you look at it under electron microscope, this is how the structure looks. So you can see sort of spaghetti-like or ingredient-like web of tubelets that intertwine, and they leave quite a bit of open air within them, which we like because we said, well, this is what we need for insulation. Insulation is primarily air. Air is great insulator. It's free. And it's um, non-toxic. It's um, really fantastic material. But the problem is, how do you keep it within a matrix that uh, does not allow, allow it to escape. So that was the next challenge. And then we said, well, let's, let's come up with some blends. 
So we started with uh, chopping some birch wood uh, from the silva into kind of a fine, fine uh, sawdust and um, mix it with some grass, Alaskan grasses. Um, and uh, to see if we can feed this spinstock to the, to the fungus and, and if the fungus will actually grow through it. And we quickly found that there is a pretty fine um, balance between the humidity, temperature, and the feedstock that we need to give it for the, for the organism to be happy and grow quickly. But once we, we got it dialed in, so to say, we, we then discovered that it only takes about seven days for the fungus to grow through this matrix and colonize it completely. And if you think about it, um, this process is uh, independent of the size of the object that you are biomanufacturing. Oh. So in other words, yeah, that's exactly what we said. We actually were really impressed. Because if you think of the normal manufacturing process, it's, it's totally dependent on the scale. Right? It's kind of like cooking. You know, there's a very big difference between cooking for a family and cooking for 100 people. Right? Um, and it's the same with manufacturing. In manufacturing, um, scaling up means that you require completely different technology, completely different um, set of tools to make um, th thousands of those panels come off the conveyor belt. But not here. <laughs> and for that, it's, it's really um, an interesting kind of edge um, that biotechnologists and bioengineering actually gives us. And that is what we really decided to capitalize on. So we started making these tubelets, um, well, tubes, that we decided then to, um, to test under different conditions. So um, our process, and I will step through this quickly. So our process was basically we take petri dish uh, with, with a living organism, just pure culture. Uh, with, uh, we started with about five candidates, the, the, uh, the, fungus, uh, fun, uh, the fungi that I showed in the beginning. And we zeroed uh, in on one, um, that's the last one, that white looking fungus that doesn't have a body, which we can find right around the corner, actually, if you look in the woods carefully. Well, there are not many woods in Sp Spinar, but if you <laughs> drive out to Gertrude, that, that it is actually present there. Uh, and then we started blending it with different kinds of kind of substrates. So we started with birch and uh, grass, we added a, uh, a little bit of nutrients to it, and what we found is that uh, within seven days, once we pour it into mold, within seven days it becomes a uh, becomes really solid object. And those solid objects then went into testing environment. This is how they looked. Um, so this is uh, the tubes that were packed seven days before uh, with just a kind of a slurry of, of cells and um, and uh, cellulose. And uh, seven days later, we essentially pop them out of the pipes of a plunger and put them in, put them in, a, in an oven to dry. Okay. So, uh, and then, the next, um, the next thing was to, to get an engineer on board, and I teamed up with Dr. Joey Young from the um, Department of Civil Engineering at URA, who is a permafrost engineer, and an interesting thing happened. We would bring them this live specimens and say, well, look, they have all these interesting properties, we'd like to uh, check, check how the R value is, and how how it holds, you know, against more water and, more, and, and and you know temperature extremes. And what we found out is that engineers, unlike biologists, like things dead. <laughs> <laughs> they absolutely don't tolerate anything leaving. <laughs> and and uh, it's not. By the way, I'm not. I don't mean to bash any engineers. That there are any engineers in the room. It's not against the engineering profession. It's just to say. Um, that was a striking 
difference from the field of um, you know, environmental science and biology where we want to, for the most part, to keep things alive and the rest we can do just study them. And the reason these guys really want to kill everything is because if you keep it alive, it's not a constant state, right? It changes as it grows and, and the material properties change quite rapidly as the organism uh, digests cellulose and you can imagine, so we have about 100% biological efficiency in these organisms. So as it's eaten through whatever food we give it, it's, it's essentially changing its, its, um, its mechanical internal properties daily or hourly. So for that, we had to come up with a way of, uh, of quickly killing them, and it was not simple. <laughs> and, and the reason it wasn't simple is because, remember I mentioned the, the story about the, the dry carbon in Fairbanks? <laughs> so uh, it's very tolerant to high and low temperatures. Uh, for, because it's a cosmopolitan fungus, it's, it grows really all over the top of the world, and, um, and it's, it's adapted very well to, to extreme environments. So when we try to heat it to, uh, to 60 degrees centigrade, guess what, the edges would die, but the inside of the material block would survive. <laughs> and in a few days, we would see that it, this now becomes bigger, so our sample would, would expand. <laughs> and uh, of course, the, the uh, engineers in the group would, would be like, well, it was 5% lighter yesterday, how is it? now 5% heavier <laughs> compared to yesterday. And you would just say, well, maybe it's well from the humidity. And so it turns out it was because of cell division. It had nothing to do with humidity. So, so we found out that at 80 degrees centigrade, and that's pretty hot, it's like sauna temperature, um, it actually does eventually die, but we have to also dehydrate it. Okay? And, um, we couldn't get it cold enough to figure out if the cold would actually eventually kill it. So, because we went to, down to minus 50 and it was still, uh, still bounced back. So, um, so you can see that it, it, it presented some challenges just in the process. So, this is actually trying, uh, trying to squeeze this column to break it into a um, it, and, and as it breaks it, it records the, uh, the, the moment the material fails, it crumbles. And so it's a stress strain curve that's necessary for material uh, properties. And you can see that the stress strain curve, um, when, when the material actually collapses, it kind of creates this S. And it's hard to see on these images. But it doesn't fail as in the block of concrete when it just complete, completely crumbles into subsequent pieces of. Of, you know, of uh, sand, really, right? Uh, it actually kind of around it, it, it kind of squishes like a uh, like a sponge. So it's, it was very interesting to see this kind of type of failure because it's unusual to see in uh, in non-living uh, organisms, non-living materials, and. Um, this is some elastic properties. So it's basically how how um, how this material takes share and how it takes stress that's perpendicular to its, its axis. I'm going to step through this. Um, so this is this is actually important um, graph. You can see that. So there's one loop, the green one, that shoots up, um, and um, and it it shows really. And higher properties in terms of feeling. So when it comes to this point, it is this, this maximum the material can take in terms of stress and strain relationship. And when it has back down, it means it just failed. So that, that's where you get this X pattern on the block. Right? Uh, the rest of them were much, um, much less strong. So this is in kilopascals, and as the strength applied by the plunger is pushing down on it. And, um, then what we noticed is that there was one specific group, this green one, again, you can see that this is again on top of, of the chart, because now it's, uh, it's looking at thermal conductivity. And thermal conductivity is, is what, what we look for in insulation materials. So 
if the thermal effectivity is high, it's bad for insulation because it means that it allows the energy to travel really quickly across the unit of material. But if it's low, it's good because it means that it prevents that energy transfer across this expensive material. So we want to keep it lower, right? And what we found is that um, when we kill the living cells within the glass wall, it, um, it does on par with plastic insulation. So the um, blue form and, uh, and, uh, and pink foam that we could get at Home Depot now would have thermal conductivity value of around here. So one of those groups actually kind of matches it. And around here, this is this is where you start all top holes. Right? It's still, uh, not as good of insulator, but it still works pretty well if you buy a cup of coffee with it. I, I advise against it just because what I do, what we mentioned about the plastic proper properties and its portability and fire grade. But um, over here is is where your uh, block of wood is. Right? So um, a piece of wood like this would um, would conduct much better than any of this. Right? So this is this was already quite interesting because we know now that's better than wood. We know that we can match it with 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 uh, polymeric foam that that is derived from from oil that has very complex manufacturing process that produces a lot of um, downstream toxicity and never biodegrades in our environment. So then we said, well, let's let's look at this one group that that does better than others. And when we found this this group three, if you remember from a couple of previous graphs, this group three is now in the middle. Right? So um, so I actually highlighted it. You can you, you cannot see what this initial individual things actually mean because it's too tiny, unfortunately. Sorry about that. But this is thermal conductivity. Um, this is com uh, compressor, com compressive strength. This is this is Young's model. This is the shear strength. Um, this is uh, the um, water uh, absorption. And this, I believe, this I can't actually read at all. <laughs> I can't remember what the answer is. What is interesting is both in living, so the, the, um, the um, first bar is the living organism, and the second bar is the organism that has been rendered biologically inactive, so it's one that we fried. <laughs> and in, all, in both cases, it really does you know, well better than, than the, re the rest of the samples. So we, we, you know, we went through a series of experiments trying to feed the, the the, the same fund with different types of um, blends. And this, um, this particular group, for whatever reason, was more successful than others in keeping the, the, the material properties on par with plastic insulation. And we keep referring back to plastics because that's, if you will, that's the competition. So um, now, this is where we kind of stand right now. So, um, so a high-end styrofoam is about 0.038. Our fungi uh, biocomposite is uh, 0 0.46, uh, just above it. And uh, the, the both experiments we eventually came up to much to match the uh, the, um, the conductivity. You can also see that the densities on, in both cases are much higher than the density of styrofoam. And that is for the reason that we give it um, sawdust. And sawdust, by nature, is heavier than our top there. But that's a nutrient source that we, we have to provide for it to grow. So, um, and I'll talk about it in a minute, but it's, it's, if you think about construction material, lighter is better because it's easier for workers to move, move it around. Uh, it's also easier to transport. And so uh, that's one area that we, both, uh, we are focusing on right now, is to, to come up with a way of producing the same, the same um, quality insulation, but with lesser weight. 
this is just a tiny weight over here. So, um, again, of course, back to the question every time I present this, the big question that comes up is well, how is this, is this dangerous? Is this toxic? This is a fungus, after all. And what I found out that uh, in, in North America, um, the um, audience are your audiences are typically unfamiliar with fungi. In Eurasia, we use many, many um, fungi for food. For that reason, people are very comfortable with harvesting fungi, identifying them. And there isn't the same fear. I just came uh, uh, from Russia about a month ago where I presented this in the Congress, and none of the questions about toxicity came up. But guess what happens here when you bring this topic people in the audience immediately start asking a question about toxicity and is it dangerous? And so the answer is actually uh, it is not dangerous because of two reasons. One, the organism that we are using, the actual fungus, has been proven to not have toxicity to humans. And the other reason is that the, um, the organism is kept in vegetative state. So it's, uh, we actually kill it before it become, before, before it produces fruiting bodies, before, before it produces spores, so that the cycle never completes. For that, the spores that are source of allergens often um, would, would not be available. They, they just don't, the organism doesn't have the time to result. It takes a couple of years, actually, which, which is beyond the, our seven-day cycle. Um, However, we had to actually, we, we felt compelled to do this toxicity study and found out that there is no, that there is no toxicity associated with this organism to human cells. So, um, now, um, So the next um, step we're working on right now is, of course, well, we want to see if there's a way for us to lighten the, uh, the material without losing all this, all this focus to be interested in. And one of the ways to do this, is, of course, is to create kind of a skeleton for it to grow through. And that skeleton can be... Um, it has to be very small in size because there is a limit how far this little height and this little uh, tentacles can leap. But yet, there is also a um, question of the nutrients. The, the scaffold itself can't be nutritive, so that if the organism is essentially latching on it, and feeding it on, on, on it at the same time, it would provide this kind of lightweight foam structure that would then allow us to, to create much lighter blocks at the same rate and yet not have this extra weight that can, comes with, with adding soil dust. We know that uh, there is um, quite a bit of effort right now going into 3D printing with, with fire inks. Uh, and bio ink is kind of a fancy word for uh, essentially um, a slurry that, um, that is formed into a filament um, and has living cells within it. So as the 3D printer head is printed, the object is, is deposited in this little, little um, tubelet that's extruded from the printer head and it's built in a shape, but that shape is found not by just mechanical forces, but also by, by the, the force of cells that give them each other and create bonds. Does it make sense? So, um, this was not intentional. <laughs> that big round thing. I don't know what the image meant, but uh, the idea here was to show you that that in certain polar world, um, the expanse of permafrost is still vast, 
is shrinking, but it's last. And um, applications for materials that that can be um, can provide high level of insulation, thermal insulation for infrastructure, for housing, for pipes, for packaging, uh, vast. Yet uh, we don't have a substitute for plastics right now. And uh, this logic that whatever comes to the north stays in the north is true not just in Alaska, but it's really true across most of the north. Because the transportation is so expensive that, that it's very rare that, that one the, once the lifespan of, say, a road is over and the road is rebuilt, that, that the stuff that has been used to construct it is ever removed. Right? Um, and so there is real incentive to push for this type of technologies. And we found that, um, that there is a lot of work that's happening in parallel with this. We actually have um, a team of colleagues that's working in New York uh, that is creating packaging for Dell servers and Dell computers called Incubative. And they have been doing really interesting work in, uh, in sort of challenging the packaging industry to come up with, uh, with packaging that can be biodegradable. Um, and, and this is similar in some ways. The difference in our situation is that um, unlike packaging, insulation has to be held to pretty high standards environmentally. It has to also perform over time as well. So that this kind of pressure to meet the requirements of the construction industry while also meeting the, the, the kind of mandate to create material that can be safely crumbled and put in your garden is, is, is um, the tension is there. And so we actually enjoy working at this edge. Uh, we recently come up with a method uh, to layer the sheets of, um, of fungus um, in, in a way that creates a gap between them. So, and the gap uh, has, um, it's a very small gap. So if you imagine two sheets of paper uh, that are open, hanging on top of each other, um, this, um, this gap is quickly filled with the fungus. So it creates kind of a biological foam board. And that foam board actually has much higher um, uh, tensile strength because now you have two sheets of, of micro paper, what we call, right? Um, that hold it together and tension. Uh, and it becomes kind of um, analogous structure to what your foam board, for, you know, that uses now styrofoam to fill that gap is. And um, this uh, is to sum up what, what I just mentioned. It, so it's lightweight, uh, has high R value. It's ra rapidly renewable. We can actually chop up um, locally available wood, wood uh, from, uh, say, construction um, and use that chop up wood to fit the fungus that can be then used for, uh, for producing the material for the house on, on, uh, on, from the plot where the, 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 the uh, plants have been removed to, from. Right? So it's, it's kind of a cyclic thing. And, and the advantage of this approach is that you are sequestering the carbon that otherwise would be released into atmosphere. So this whole idea of kind of closing the, the greenhouse effects loop um, by taking the material um, that, that is rich in carbon and feeding it to, um, to an organism that can uptake it and fixate it within its matrix, as opposed to releasing it back, in, uh, back in, uh, into the atmosphere, is, is really central to this. Non-toxicity and um, the fact that it's local, you can really do it here. So I think this is kind of all I have. Um, so yeah, uh, this, this yeah, I, I should mention this. So we were uh, we have submitted a patent. We are doing. Um, we actually finished fire resistance and water tests. Uh, we are looking at 3D printing into it, um, and we have now uh, have two papers. That one has been accepted. One has been still reviewed. Uh, is still reviewed as far as I, I remember today uh, on the, the biotechnology behind it. And I'm going to step through this quickly because there's some technical info there. And this is uh, the team of our resident, resident scientists from Alaska 
uh, native science and engineering program from the summer, Eric Kito actually met some of them. Uh, they really were uh, brilliant in coming up with ideas to uh, substitute biological material for plastic in their environment. So their challenge was actually to come up with with, um, with objects that are made out of, of our biofoam that will replace plastic within their households. And you can see that in, in there are many, many, um, many different attempts. You know, these are costas for, um, for cups, for, for elders, for tea or coffee cups. This is a building block that's kind of made on, on a premise of Tetris, and so is this. And this is uh, Legos, essentially mushroom Legos. If you leave it alive, before, um, before um, long, the, the uh, units fuse into a continuous surface. So you essentially have this Legos that become a wall. Right? Um, and we really uh, had a lot of fun last summer playing with this. Uh, you can see that there are all kinds of attempts to, to do um, one-up uh, plastics, as they called it. And some of them were absolutely brilliant. And I think this is probably the best class I've ever had to teach. And, and um, many of them actually took the samples they produced back to the communities they came from. And they're hearing really interesting reports where elders actually come in and, and respond to this uh, uh, to these objects in a way that, that's, um, that's really revealing. For example, um, this one young lady from, uh, from, from Bethel came back uh, and said, oh, you know, my grandma mentioned how we could, you know, reuse, reuse this, this really hard polypores uh, to, to, to make um, objects that, um, that would hold, um, hold a pre precious small um, uh, make boxes that would hold uh, you know, important things, richer important things within the boxes. Um, and, and you can think about it because you know, the idea was to make something flo floating, right? so, so the hunters could take it uh, out uh, with them on sea. And so this buoyant thing now that's, that's holding something really important can, can be uh, you know, you know, taken on boat. And so there are all these ideas, and of course, in the middle is for this, this thinking, well, can we make you know, powders from it? Can we make buoys that, that can, can serve their, their, uh, their, their, do their job you know, in marine environment, and then, then eventually decompose without, without impact that the plastic buoys would, would, you know, would produce, and break down into harmless um, kind of slurry of soap dust. So that's that's the thing. That's it. Um, this is my let's see. This is my contact information. Uh, we are of course looking for new ideas, and you're welcome to come and visit our lab. Um, get in touch if you're interested. And um, if there are any questions, I'm happy to to address them. Dr. Austin's boss, we will be here briefly to answer any questions you have. But first, uh, we'll go ahead and give him uh, uh, a thank you from uh, Alaska's Anchorage Science Pub here today. Uh, first, our certificate that we handed out to all our presenters uh, as a thank you. And then, of course, our, uh, our gift card that we get from the tap roots to uh, whatever you would like to have. And, of course, a, a drink token. <laughs> And we did give him one of our, uh, our pint glasses, which he has already gone and used. So, <laughs> it's uh, our Anchor Science Club logo on it, uh, 2016, with the molecule for ethyl alcohol uh, engraved on the back. <laughs> Thank you very much for uh, your time here today, Dr. All right, and uh, we'll get to our uh, trivia answers.